is awesome but it can also seem really overwhelming. Thankfully, there are core concepts you can focus on that can help you understand it all. And one of these is the idea of charge and partial charge and thinking of all these interactions through the lens of charge. So you have this basic idea that opposite charges attract like charges repel. And this is also true of partial charges as well, including temporary charges. And so although we might focus on thinking like plus and minus, we can actually have this partial plus and partial minus that we don't really think about because these molecules are neutral overall, but really these partial charges, even these ones that are just kind of like fleeting, can induce these interactions that are going to allow molecules to stick to one another long enough to do cool stuff. And you have enough of those weak interactions and now molecules are stuck really, really tightly together. And so a lot of biochemistry involves these more fleeting interactions, these partial charge, partial charge attractions, rather than full charge attractions and rather than actually atoms kind of linking up to form what we call covalent bonds. So today I want to talk more about this concept of kind of thinking in the lens of these partial charges. Be it full or partial, the basis of all of these charges is going to be subatomic. So when we talk about atoms, we're talking about the individual units of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. All of those letters you'll find on the periodic table. Each of these atoms is made up of smaller parts, these subatomic particles, which are protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons are positively charged, the electrons are negatively charged, and the neutrons are neutral. Now the protons and the neutrons that hang out in this dense central core called the nucleus, and then the electrons go whizzing around them. It's the number of protons that determines the element's identity. So for example, a hydrogen is always going to have one proton, a carbon is always going to have six, an oxygen is always going to have eight. But it's the electrons that we care most about because these are going to be what's going to be interacting between different atoms in order to form bonds and interactions. Because that number of protons is fixed, but the number of electrons can vary, this can give you different charged molecules or what we call ions, and the electrons can actually kind of move around. So although the protons are stuck in place in that central nucleus, the electrons, they kind of live in these electron clouds and they can shift. And therefore when they shift, they can influence where the charge is located and introduce partial charges to regions of an atom, as we'll see, which can allow you to have things like polarity, which are going to allow for partial charge-based attractions. Now, if you look at the periodic table of elements, it can look kind of overwhelming. But thankfully, in biochemistry, we're typically only dealing with a few of these elements. The main ones we're going to be dealing with are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and hydrogen. And when it comes to these, we don't even have to focus on most of the protons or most of the electrons. Instead, what we typically focus on is the outermost electrons, what we call the valence electrons. These are the electrons that are farthest away from the nucleus. And remember, the nucleus is where the protons are. You have the positive charge of the protons reigning in the negative charge of the electrons. And you can think of it kind of like dogs on a leash. In this way, the valence electrons that are furthest away from the nucleus are going to have the most energy and they're going to be able to move around. You can kind of think of it like dogs on a leash where these electrons are these energetic dogs. The farther they are from the nucleus, the looser they are on their leash and the more energy they have to roam around. This is going to then make these the most reactive. And so the farthest most electrons we call the valence electrons. And these are the ones that we're going to focus on most of the time. One of the, one of the reasons we focus on these valence electrons is because atoms can actually share or um, swap electrons in order to form what we call covalent bonds. Now, in a covalent bond, what's actually happening is these two multiple atoms are actually kind of overlapping their electron clouds. So remember, those electrons are kind of whizzing around in these clouds. And when they overlap lap regions of their clouds, they can share pairs of electrons to form what we call covalent bonds. Now, the number of electrons that atoms will actually share is going to depend on how many electrons they need in order to kind of like fulfill their ideal number, which is going to depend on um, things outside the scope of this post. But basically, they want to have this full outer shell. 
And to get there, they have to add a certain number. And the certain number that they need is going to depend on how many they currently have. And how many they currently have can be seen if you look down a column on the periodic table. And for this reason, elements that are below one another on the periodic table, so phosphorus and nitrogen or sulfur and oxygen, they're going to tend to behave very similarly in terms of how they form these covalent bonds, where they're actually sharing pairs of electrons. Now, you see this focus on these covalent bonds a lot in chemistry. You also see talk of ionic bonds. Now, ionic bonds, basically, these are where one of the molecules is giving up electrons to another molecule. And this is making the, one of the molecules have a full positive charge and one have a full negative charge. And they're going to be attracted to one another strongly. So they're going to stick to one another. And this is what you see with like sodium chloride, so table salt. Now, this isn't like a covalent bond in terms of these atoms are not overlapping their clouds. They're just stuck really tightly together. So don't be confused by that. But in terms of a covalent bond, they're actually overlapping their clouds. And we see this a lot in chemistry because when we're talking about covalent bonds, this is how we're actually making molecules. So when you have a molecule, this means that you have atoms like linked together through covalent bonds. And different molecules are going to be basically individual thingamabobs that are hooked together all the atoms are hooked together through covalent bonds. So a molecule is held together by covalent bonds through intramolecular forces. So intra within the molecule. But often in biochemistry, we're dealing with intermolecular interactions. So interactions between molecules. If we're talking about between molecules, these aren't, are not going to be covalent bonds. Instead, they're going to be non-covalent bonds or attractions. And these are going to be based on partial charge, partial charge attractions, often through things like polarity. So you will get much more into this. But I just want to mention that you will see covalent bonds come up in biochemistry, especially when we're talking about metabolism, so the making and the breaking of molecules. So we have catabolism, the breakdown of molecules, and anabolism, the making of molecules. And when we're talking about making molecules, we're typically talking about nucleophile, electrophile interactions, much more in these and other posts. But basically, remember that in order to form a covalent bond, atoms are going to share pairs of electrons. And in order to share pairs of electrons, the molecules to do this, they're going to want to get something out of it. And so one of the atoms is going to want to get more electrons. And we call this um, the electrophile because it, it loves those electrons. And then the other molecule is going to want to get rid of some electrons or get some help holding on to those electrons. So we call that the nucleophile. It's seeking a nucleus, which is where the protons are, which can help it hang, which can help it rein in those electrons. So we get nucleophiles attack electrophiles, and this is where we get interactions like substitution and elimination that lead to the formation of new bonds. And if you in biochemistry, some key groups to look out for when we're talking about these nucleophilic interactions and making new bonds include things like hydroxyl groups, sulfhydryl groups, um, amine groups. You'll see a lot of these in amino acids, and you can check out my post on amino acids for much more on all of these. But these are the exception to the rule we're talking about biochemistry when we're actually making molecules, at least depending on what type of biochemistry you're studying. Most of the time in biochemistry, when we're talking about macromolecular interactions and things like this, we're talking about interactions between proteins or between proteins and nucleic acids, so like DNA and RNA. All of these interactions that we're talking about, they're not involving actual swapping of electrons or sharing of electrons. We're not forming new covalent bonds. Instead, what we're doing is we're having attractions between molecules. Um, so between molecules, remember, not covalent interactions. These non-covalent interactions are going to be on the basis of partial charge, partial charge attractions, even when it doesn't look like that. And so sometimes it can be easy to see what where we're getting charge-based attractions from. Say, for example, in the context of a protein, you have some positively charged amino acids, so the basic amino acids, lysine, arginine, histidine, and then you have some negatively charged amino acids, glutamate and aspartate.
But this is a small proportion of the amino acids in a protein, and they don't play that large of a role in protein folding typically. Yes, you can get these interactions between these charge groups, and we call these salt bridges or ionic bonds, um, such as between a glutamate and a lysine. But often what you're dealing with is going to be partial charge-based attractions and often even just like temporary charge-based attractions driven more by water excluding the amino acids based on water-water interactions than based on the actual affinity of these amino acids for one another. And we'll get more into what I mean in just a second. In order to understand how we can get these partial charge, partial charge attractions though, we need to go back to the idea of what these atoms are made up of. So remember, we have those neutrons, those electrons, and the protons. And the protons and the electrons are going to be the charged ones. The protons are stuck in place, but the electrons can move around. And when you're in a molecule, the electrons, so in a molecule, remember, the bonds are formed by sharing pairs of electrons. But that sharing is not always fair. And when this sharing isn't fair, the electrons can hang out more with one atom than they do with another. And this introduces a concept we call polarity, which leads to part of the molecule being negatively charged and part of it being positively charged. When we talk about this partial charge, we draw this little sign, this delta sign. So this is like a, a lowercase uh, Greek D, so it's like a delta. Um, and then a delta minus would be a partial negative charge and a delta plus would be a partial positive charge. There are also some complicating factors in terms of polarity, in terms of the charges can cancel each other out if they're pulling in opposite directions, but I'm not going to go there. A key example we think of in terms of polarity is going to be a water molecule. If you think about that Mickey Mouse, the oxygen, um, so you can think of the electrons are kind of being drawn towards Mickey's chin, away from Mickey's ears, and this is leaving this hydrogen partly positive and the, the oxygen partly negative. And now we can go back to that core concept we've been talking about from the beginning, which is that opposite charges attract and like charges repel, and extend this to thinking of partial charges as well. So even though if we look at a water molecule, it might be neutral overall because it has an equal number of electrons and protons, we still have those partial charged regions. And those partial charged regions, the oppositely charged ones, are going to be attracted to one another. And this is going to cause them to form these networks, to form these interactions. And in fact, water is this really great example, but you also see similar things happen in all sorts of biological molecules. When you have this happen in certain situations, we call it a hydrogen bond. When you have the partial negative thing is going to be an electronegative atom. So something that's hogging electrons that has a pair of lone electrons, um, so unpaired electrons, and that will be our acceptor. And then our donor is going to be a hydrogen attached to something electronegative, so such as the hydrogen on a water molecule. This is just a special case of one of these partial um, charge, partial charge attractions. Um, and we call this a hydrogen bond. In this case, what we have is we have a permanent dipole. So it, it's always going to be that the oxygen is going to be pulling these electrons in the away from the hydrogens because a, a, oxygen is inherently more electronegative. So this is going to be a permanent dipole. This is going to be a permanently polar molecule. And this is going to allow for these strong interactions on these strong partial charge, partial charge attractions. We see it in water. We see it between the bases of DNA. This is what's holding strands of DNA together. We see it in the backbone of proteins, what's giving proteins their secondary structure. There are things like alpha helices and beta sheets and beta strands. This is coming from hydrogen bonding in the backbone of the protein because proteins have this, um, the same backbone, the same generic backbone, it's only the unique side chains that differ, um, and then the number of amino acids that proteins have that differ. But they have this regular repeating pattern in their backbone, which is going to allow them to form these characteristic secondary structures, thanks to hydrogen bonding. And all of this is happening due to these partial charge, partial charge attractions based on what we call these permanent dipoles and these permanently partial charges. The same molecules are what we call nonpolar, and they actually share electrons fairly. So this can happen between, say, carbon and hydrogen. And what this typically makes is this makes these molecules what we call hydrophobic. 
if we think back to a water molecule, it's going to be have that permanent dipole. It's going to be very sticky to other water molecules. And in order to, so it's going to form these like water networks. And in order to let something else into their network, the water molecules are going to have to like that other thing more than, or at least as much as they like other water molecules. We call these things that water likes hydrophilic, but things that water doesn't like. So if water prefers itself to another molecule, we call that other molecule hydrophobic. And those hydrophobic molecules are going to be excluded from the water network. So we have the water network where it's forming these charge, um, these partial charge, partial charge attractions with other water molecules. If there's a molecule you stick in there that can't give it a partial charge, partial charge, or a partial charge, full charge attraction, the water is going to exclude it. And this is going to clump those things together into a kind of clump. Um, and this is what we call the hydrophobic effect. So those molecules that are nonpolar, the molecules that the water doesn't want to hang out with, they're kind of going to be driven together. Now, when these molecules are get driven together, we get something we call like hydrophobic interactions. This can be a kind of tricky concept because what's happening is not just that the water is excluding these molecules, um, but what's actually happening is that when the water excludes these molecules, these molecules can actually form some interactions with one another, even, even though these molecules seem really, really blah. And this is because even non-polar molecules can get these what we call temporary dipoles or induced dipoles. So those electrons, remember, are just whizzing around in those clouds. If something negatively charged comes by, those electrons are going to flee from that negative charge. And if there's another atom next to them, this can cause a chain reaction. We can have this original external charge that kind of kickstarts thing come from an ion, so from, say, a salt molecule. Or it can come from a permanent dipole, such as a water molecule. Um, and the most water molecule, the oxygen, is going to get the electrons to flee from one side of a molecule to the other side, which will get the atoms of the electron, with the electrons of the atom next to it, to flee from one side to the other side, and you get these chain reactions. But what happens if you don't have you don't have any obvious charge. You can still get what we call an instantaneous charge, an instantaneous dipole, because those electrons are randomly whizzing around. When we think about random, we tend to think about like even, like if you were to flip coins, you would say, okay, well, if, I was, if it was random, you might expect like heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, right? Wrong. Well, I mean, you might sometimes get that, but it's actually, you're also going to get heads, 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 heads. And that's not that the die are loaded or anything. Like maybe if you got that every single time, but you're going to get these streaks of times where you're going to get things that don't seem like random. And you can have these electrons that are randomly moving around and some of them just happen to be more hanged out in one region. This can start an instantaneous dipole, which can set off a chain reaction. Sometimes these are called London forces or dispersion forces, and they are individually weak, but they can be collectively very strong. These electrons are whizzing around randomly, and so if more of them happen to be in one area than happen to be in another area, well, then that area is going to have a partial charge, and so is the region that they left. So these are just these like fleeting inter these fleeting moments where one re one part of the molecule is going to be positive, and one part is going to be negative. Now, if it were just in isolation, that wouldn't be that big of a deal. But these electro but these atoms are right next to one another, and therefore they're going to influence one another. And if there's a region of an electron of an atom that becomes negatively charged, and there's another um, there's another atom next to it, the electrons near those that negatively charged part of the first atom are going to get repelled, and this can cause kind of like chain reactions, which is going to get these atoms to kind of sync up their electron clouds and allow you to get these interactions, these kind of like chain link interactions, where these atoms are forming these partial charge, partial charge attractions, even though these molecules are nonpolar overall. This can lead to collectively strong but individually weak interactions that can allow for things like geckos walking up walls or the DNA helix kind of get, holding its shape together. So although we often focus on the base pairing interactions in when we're talking about DNA strands zipping together, so we have that A to T um, 
and that C to G, those interactions where we have these hydrogen bonds between the different bases and the different strands. Now, we also have what we call base pairing. So that would be what we call base pairing interactions, but we also have base stacking interactions where between kind of the rungs of the ladder, between these actual bases, you're going to have these partial charge, partial charge attractions based on the syncing up of these electron clouds. And that is actually the main reason why the CG regions are going to be more stable and stronger. It's not because they have three hydrogen bonds versus the two of AT, but it's because they have stronger base stacking interactions. So between the actual kind of like steps of the ladder, the rungs of the ladder, the electrons in these bases are kind of above and below the planes of this um, of the this planar bases and they can kind of sync up and more on this in my post on DNA structure. But those base stacking interactions between the different rungs are actually going to be a key driving force of holding the DNA um, more stable and making it harder to come apart. When we talk about these intermolecular forces, the combination of these intermolecular forces, so these forces between the molecules, are often called van der Waals forces. So you might see that term used. Some key concepts to keep in mind, opposite charges attract and like charges repel. It doesn't matter where this charge come from and it doesn't have to be a full charge. So as we just saw in the intermolecular forces, we could have that charge come from an ion, it could be coming from a permanent dipole, it could be coming from a temporary dipole, it could be coming from just a random movement of electrons. And those charges can be full or partial and they don't have to be permanent. This is applying at both the large scale, so when we have our whole molecules interacting with one another through those IMFs, but it's also occurring at the small scale. So when we're talking about electrons within the atoms within molecules, the reason why electrons, why molecules take their shapes, why those electrons tend to hang out in certain orbitals and things like this, why atoms are certain distances from one another, this all has to do with charge-based interactions as well, when we're talking about the electrons and the protons and things like this. In a covalent bond, the atoms are going to be closer to one another than you are in a non-covalent interaction. But the atoms don't like super duper overlap. They just overlap their clouds a little bit. And they don't go any closer because if they were to go closer, then their electron clouds re would repel one another. And so even in this makeup of the molecules themselves, you're seeing these charge-based um, forces at play. When it comes to IMFs and when it comes to these subatomic things, the bigger the opposite chargeness, the stronger the attraction, and the further apart the charges, the, op the weaker the attraction. Charge-based attractions are fickle friends, they're weak and easily reversible, but lots of these small attractions can add up to be pretty powerful stickiness. Just ask the gecko ge gecko gecko's feet. Hope this helped you understand intermolecular interactions and the basis of charge at the heart of a lot of things in biochemistry.